So in 2010, I was diagnosed with an autoimmune disease called lupus. And it's a disease that affects 90% more women and people born female than men. And I was diagnosed with it after I developed a life-threatening heart condition and was rushed to the emergency room. The heart condition was very mysterious and I just had my second baby who also coincidentally had a heart condition while I was pregnant. And it turned out that both of these conditions were being caused by my own immune system, which was mounting in response and actually attacking the function of first my unborn baby's heart and secondly, my heart. So I was given a diagnosis by a rheumatologist who's a specialist in autoimmune diseases and really knows how to kind of piece through all the symptoms and what kind of blood work to ask for. But generally speaking, there's not a, a lot of knowledge of, of consistent knowledge in general medical practice about autoimmunity and how to diagnose it. Lupus ordinarily takes between four and six years to be conclusively diagnosed. So in this respect, from when I first got really sick to when I was diagnosed, it was pretty fast. But actually, for about seven years before my diagnosis, I'd been having what I now know are the characteristic symptoms of lupus. So these include joint pain, migraines, photosensitivity, so being sensitive to the sunlight, um, mental health issues, I think, associated with being in a lot of pain. And whenever I went to the doctor, invariably I was dismissed as either being anxious or hormonal or one doctor suggested I might be pregnant and not realize it another tried to diagnose me with gout um, and this kind of went on and on this just general sort of disbelief diminishment dismissal of my pain so I mean really I had an underlying disease but I was never referred for any diagnostic tests the pain was never taken seriously enough to be seen as an indicator of something else that was going on. And so the book really came from a realization that this experience I'd had was a profoundly gendered one. And I started to look through medicine's history as a way to sort of come to terms with my, not just my illness, but also the lack of kind of understanding around what autoimmunity is, why it affects more women than men, you know, why it's so unpredictable. I was a history researcher at the time that I was diagnosed, looking into feminist histories of art. So this was kind of my impulse anyway, to look back, to try and understand where we are now. And I came across all these women in case studies, textbooks, you know, across the annals of, of medicine over, you know, a century, two centuries, three centuries. And there was something so familiar in their experiences that I thought, well, okay, you know, medical science has progressed exponentially, you know, but yet our medical attitudes towards women's bodies, especially towards women's pain, especially towards illness symptoms that aren't maybe immediately diagnosable, hasn't really moved on much at all. So that was really the impetus for me to tell this story of why a woman like me and, you know, thousands, hundreds of thousands, possibly millions of others were experiencing, you know, sort of degrees of medical neglect, degrees of medical mistreatment. And I just wanted to really go back to the beginning of medical history and sort of build this story of how we got to where we are today. How, I mean, and, and it, it really, when you see it in the context of, of history, it really becomes um, rather, sort of, I mean, uh, you know, very clear. It really is sort of amazing that you could sort of if you had a, a time machine, go back in time and <laughs> almost see the exact same doctor. Uh, it, <laughs> Pretty much. But with that said, how how do you? And then I want to talk about that history. But how do you? Wh wh when you had that realization that it was gendered, like how do you? Like what is the counterfactual? Had you gone in as a man, and I'm talking prior to the pregnancy, right? For those seven or eight years, like and it. it I mean, it's absurd that they never said like, hey, you know, this has been going on for like two or three years or four years or five years or six years. Maybe we should take the next step. What like, but how do you, as you come to that realization that it's gendered, how do you make that, you know, what, how do you formulate that counterfactual? Had you gone in there and you, you, you were uh, a, a man? 
But I think there are a couple of things working against women when they go to the doctor's office, which was something that when I was first diagnosed became a kind of anecdotal or intuitive realization because I was diagnosed and then, you know, I would talk about this experience with female friends or relatives and there would be invariably some kind of similar experience. Oh yeah, doctors don't listen. You know, I went through awful menopause symptoms, doctors didn't listen. I actually had undiagnosed heart disease, doctors didn't listen. So it became more of this kind of intuitive sense that women just generally are disbelieved, you know, societally are, tend to be disbelieved, underestimated and taken less seriously especially when they speak about their bodies. I mean, I could see this if I didn't know necessarily at the time how systemic and ingrained this was within medicine. I, could, I was certainly very aware of it, you know, systemically and culturally and socially and other, other ways. I mean, now, you know, bias studies into medical gender bias that have been conducted over the last sort of 20 years since this issue has really started coming, pushing through have shown that it's not necessarily to do with biological sex that it that you know is set against us, but it's to do with the way that gender expression, gendered expressions of pain and bodily symptoms tend to how they are when they're spoken, you know, how how seriously they're taken. So men, not all men, of course, but men tend to express pain and things that are going in, on in their bodies in a much more straightforwardly descriptive way. And of course, men do tend to go to the doctor less if they have a worry about their bodies and pain. They, they don't tend to speak about it as much. But when they do, studies have shown that men tend to be very descriptive. So it might be like, I have a pain here. It's been painful for two weeks. And that method of speaking, that method of kind of straightforward sort of testimony really stands in people's favor when they want to be perceived as being legitimate. Women, again, not all women, tend to feminize their expressions of bodily pain. So if a woman goes to a doctor's office and speaks about a pain that might have been, you know, thwarting her for, for months or years, maybe, she might tend to express that pain in a more social more sort of psychological and emotional context in how it might affect her loved ones, how it might affect her work, her relationships, you know, her, her getting the kids to school, however that might manifest. And that sort of narrativizing, almost sort of storytelling around it is stacked against women. So we are perceived as less legitimate because of the way that we relate to pain, you know? So. I think as a man, I mean, it's it's difficult, isn't it, to tell, but I mean, certainly anecdotally, I've heard that men do tend to have their pain more, you know, rapidly and sort of seriously responded to. And there are certainly studies that have been done that, you know, bear this out. And we should say, I mean, and I think what the history makes it clear, too, is that probably a big reason why the the responses to those expressions um have disparate uh reactions is a function of the sensibility that has dominated the med medical providers so that th it's what they're responding to and they associate uh the description of pain basically because uh it has been a male dominated profession and so the I mean, it really is just like, oh, it's easier for me to empathize with a guy because I know what a guy talks like. And so I know what you're saying. The other thing sounds like eh, you just got some. Sounds hysterical. Sounds a little hysterical. <laughs> yeah. About that a bit too, because I think, you know, you, you, in your book, you talk a little bit about some of these co this coded language in history, right? Like hysteric hysteria, even going back to the days of witchcraft and stuff. And um, I think it's also important to note that uh, in terms of the, the data that you're citing, there's also a heavily racialized component as well, where uh, women, black women specifically, um, when you look into statistics in terms of pain assessment, they uh, are not perceived uh, as empathetically by doctors. And there's a kind of a vein of, uh, of you know, science around it. So no, it, it can't be 
there's no way that this could be um, influenced by our own perspectives, right? We're coming at this from a scientific method. And so there's an arrogance that's associated with that. Folks, there's more of what you've just saw where that came from. That's if you hit the subscribe and like button. Thank you. Really, thank you.